today is just about having fun. So you can set back, there are no rules, there are really no themes in this talk either, unfortunately. And the first way to have fun is just watch and observe. Right there in front of you is a stream that's coming through from a tool that we built that's called Plankton Scope. It's an open source tool for $500. Anybody can put this together. Uh, you got a chance to use a full scope. I call it the big brother of full scope. It's completely autonomous. Uh, some of you remember we went to that tube well yesterday and we collected that water. That water has infinite number of organisms. That tool is sending a wireless signal. So wherever I'm sitting, any of you on the laptop could join this and control this microscope. We could have had this microscope actually sitting somewhere in a farm and you're observing literally, I mean, just look at this biodiversity. I'm gonna stop the pump for a second um, and see how many things can you name here. Uh, you know, I see a lot of rod-like structures. There are probably cyanobacteria. There are sets of clusters, but just look at this moving amalgam of stuff. So, you know, we talked about this idea that much of biodiversity that's undiscovered is at the microscopic scale. And we will just dive into that biodiversity. Uh, and along the way, some new critters will come along. Somewhere in the middle of the talk, I'll kind of go back to this running screen for a while. But the instrument, while we are just uh, enjoying ourselves and having a talk, is imaging and observing every drop of that pond water creating a record of every single one of these species to give you an instance of what biodiversity at the microscopic scale actually looks like. So I'll just let this pump running. And from time to time, if anybody's curious, it's like watching TV, except the TV show never ends. Uh, and the number of curiosities and questions you can ask uh, in this is just absolutely infinite. You can see some of them are, uh, trying to rush uh, and flow against the flow itself. So uh, let me now go back to what I actually want to talk about. So I titled this uh, Recreational Biology. Uh, and what this means by itself is you're allowed to have fun in this talk. Uh, you don't have to take any notes. There is nothing you have to remember. Uh, <laughs> this is like TSA. OK, can you still hear me? I'll just continue, because I know I never finish my talks on time. Um, and that's why we, I'm here till 7 PM. So anybody who wants to stay, I'm actually willing to tell, tell stories till 7 PM. Um, before I begin, I just want to mention that I don't do this alone. I do this with remarkable sets of individuals and groups. Do I need a mic, actually? Can you all hear me at the back? No? OK. Yeah, can you all hear me now? What is the problem you're trying to solve? So your mic channel actually has to be connected to that. The echo from it. OK, I'll go stand there. Center point, right there. Now I'm blocking this. It does. That doesn't work. Um, yeah, so I want to begin by saying I don't work alone. I work with remarkable groups of young individuals, many people like you. These are graduate students, undergraduates in my lab, many postdocs that now have careers of their own. Uh, and it's been a really fun ride. Uh, this is a little glimpse of our discovery board uh, at the back of that blackboard that you see. Some of you who were here, we painted the entire screen yesterday with all kinds of critters and organisms that we found. And unfortunately, somebody wiped it out uh, at night. Uh, I wanted to show some of you who had not seen it. Uh, but we do this exercise all the time. And the perspective that we will take on this talk is really about biodiversity. Uh, but let's just begin with that word, uh, recreational biology. It's derived from a much more well-known field called recreational mathematics. How many of you have heard that term before? Recreational mathematics. I only see three or four hands, so that by itself is a problem. Uh, you've all played Ludo, you've all played card games. How many of you know about Rubik's Cube? Everybody. If you've done a Rubik's Cube before, you are a recreational mathematician. 
You don't even realize that you're actually solving algorithms and combinatorics. And if you've ever played a dice game, uh, you're solving all kinds of problems in probability. And this has been an entire field of mathematics. It's led to beautiful advances. But the definition of the field is that you should be able to explain the problem to anybody uh, in a very simple sentence. It has its root in historical context. How many of you know this book, Lewis Carroll's Games and Puzzles. This is Alice in Wonderland, filled with riddles of mathematics. He was actually a mathematician, and he wrote about logic and sets of ideas. You can go further back, uh, and all the way in uh, Chinese history, you actually find puzzles and games and mathematics. So in the field of mathematics, it's established that play is important to discover new ideas. And what I've been thinking quite a lot about for a while is how do you introduce that sense of play in biology? And informally, we use that to find new problems, but I'm going to try to define this a little bit today. And inspired by what happens in recreational mathematics, we will see, can we do recreational biology? Biology and physiology just for the fun of it. Not the fact that it will solve some cure important diseases or problems, not that it'll save certain aspects of climate change and environment, but just for the fun of it. And accidentally, in that process, you will find that you're actually working on very important problems. So that's the framework that we will take. And since uh, this is a talk about recreational, for people uh, who get bored out of this talk, here is your own puzzle. You can doodle. Uh, you can solve this puzzle in your head. Uh, this is a distraction for people who don't find the content on the screen interesting, which is how many pieces can you cut a donut with three planes? How many maximum number of pieces can you cut a donut with three planes? So you have a donut. Everybody knows what a donut is. You are allowed to have three straight planes. And in your head, figure out uh, throughout the talk, whosoever figures out that number, just raise your hand and shout out that number. This is your recreational mathematics uh, distraction. Uh, so we'll jump back to biology. And the first thing that we all do is there is a sense of wonder. This is my favorite children's book. I love children's books because they actually make things simple and very visual. Uh, and this is titled Wonders of Nature, where you realize sea anemones, sea lilies, sea cucumbers, and sea grapes are all animals. They're not vegetables. Uh, and one of the things uh, that's encoded in what I want to talk about today is in the eyes of that kid. I want you to be that kid when you are looking at life. And I think the moment we forget that we are here trying to understand probably the most complex thing that's self-created itself on this planet, no offense to the astronomers in the room right now, uh, or they might just say, oh, it's a, it's a subpart. Much of life on this planet is subpart of astronomy itself, which they will probably be right about. Uh, but you really have to start with wonder. And as kids, we're all curious, and you keep on going and building your capacity. And we forget the most important thing uh, in learning, which is associated with how do you keep that sense of wonder in the work that you do. So here are some tips and tools along the way. Now, the other challenge uh, is the challenge of biodiversity. This is a famous painting from Charlie Harper. And you see incredible organisms here drawn to scale. So you know, a monkey is as important as an amoeba, is as important as a gecko. And what he's trying to represent here is we will look at biodiversity as a whole, not based of our own views of what something is important. Uh, and of course, the formal way of describing is, this is our universe. Today, we will take a walk through this universe of tree of life. And I'll just give you examples from tree of life of uh, really asking these puzzles and questions. And the unfortunate reality of life sciences currently is much of the knowledge, although there are more than tens of millions of described species, much of our knowledge that's in our textbooks is really derived from 10 or 20 species, per se. And that creates a skewed view of what possibly might be. What are the bounds of life? How hot can it be and it can still live? How cold can it be? How high in the atmosphere do we have life? How deep in the Earth's crust could you actually have a living organism? How can so much pressure at the bottom of the ocean life can still survive? 
And many of these sets of things as anomalies give us the scale and the scope of what living systems can actually do. So here is the untapped potential. And again, this is really specially for the young people in the room. E.O. Wilson said this very clearly. E.O. Wilson was a very famous uh, ecologist who discovered innumerable number of ants. He said, if I was born on this planet again, I would study microbial life because it turns out 99.999% of Earth's biodiversity, let me repeat that one more time, 99.999% of Earth's biodiversity is still undescribed. I'm just talking about potential number of species that might exist. That's roughly around 1 trillion microbial species are much larger than 100 billion stars that exist in our galaxy. And again, no offense to the astronomers because they can always go outside our galaxy. But I want you to think about this number and think about how little do we actually know about our planet. And as many of you who are thinking about life science as a career, you really have to be thinking about the breadth of what might be happening. And unfortunately, even with that much diversity, what we end up finding is life science education from the first time when you all get started is about memorizing this part or this part of tree of life. It's not about problem solving. It's not about tinkering, or at least the way that we teach it. You know, so one of the context is that we don't have tools, and we will talk about how to bring access to life science tools tomorrow. Uh, we don't have uh, mentors and capacity to be able to nurture sets of curious people. And the one that gets me the most is, you know, I grew up in an era and a location in a rural town in India where I remember an exam in eighth standard when I had to label all parts of a microscope. But unfortunately, I had never seen a microscope. And I don't know how many of you, we might still be doing this as a practice. I had to tell where the objective is. I had to draw this microscope. But if I had drawn the microscope from the other perspective, I wouldn't get my score. It had to be the way it was drawn in a book. And this is the unfortunate reality of how we introduce life science currently to an average person across the world. And we have to change that. And we have to change by turning life science into just fun and curiosity. And of course, the sets of tools that allow people to experience it themselves. So let's take a jungle safari. Uh, you know, here is just an incredible illustration, and I'm going to now talk about uh, three main ideas about this talk. Uh, one is really focused on geometry and topology and some deep ideas in mathematics. Could we actually learn new mathematics by just trying to understand this biodiversity? So this is a very small portion of microbial biodiversity of uh, organisms that are called protist. And what I love is just, you can look at them. They all, I mean, there are Suctorians up there that suck all the cytoplasm of their neighbors. There is Lacrimaria. It's one of my favorite. It's the cheetah of the microbial world. And we've been studying this for a while. And you know, you just start looking at these things. This is an organism that's tintinids that like to live in wine glasses. And it starts to defy reality of what are these geometries and objects actually doing? And you know, these are not just cartoons. These are literally organisms that are alive today, and possibly some of them are in that pond water. But we have no idea. I mean, are these objects just beautiful for the sake of being beautiful? Is there a function? I mean, these are literal living organisms of our planet that we have no idea how to even start thinking about form and function. Because often enough in biology, if you understand its form, there might be a function associated with it. And I'll maybe give you hints of a few sets of puzzles that we have cracked along the way. Uh, another one, uh, this is a very famous painting from Heckel. I mean, these are all real organisms. These are living cells. And it almost looks like a crown. Uh, and these are radiolarins. And you start thinking about these sets of objects and asking, how would I even begin to understand life that looks very different from us? And much of that we will try to do with certain sets of ideas in going from observation to asking questions. So here is our first quiz or puzzle. Heckel drew this many years ago. And you can see these cells break symmetry. Symmetry breaking is an idea where if it's a sphere, you see it's symmetrical on all sides. You can rotate it. But I clearly notice 
that there is a top, there is a bottom, and there is right-left symmetry in this cell. So how do we know that if when Heckel was drawing this because there is a top and bottom, he should have not drawn it this way versus that way? And what I'm referring to is this idea that, oh, are these organisms sensing gravity? So they live in the ocean. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be nice if you drew an elephant upside down with its legs pointing up, right? You wouldn't call that an elephant. That's not a right representation. But in a cell, we don't ask that question, whether this cell has the capacity to detect gravity and whether it would prefer to be in one direction or not. If it was a sphere, that question doesn't matter. So suddenly we have gone from an observation to asking a question. This was an observation. Heckel really drew this observation. He said nothing about why it needs to have a lace-like pattern. And we have gone and turned that around to say, take the next step from observation to actually asking question. I do know the answer to this question, but I'm not going to tell you. Very much like many other puzzles that I'll share today without giving answers. Yes. 12 donut pieces. Wow. That is very close. Yes. Seven. Seven. Uh, I'm not going to give you any hints. Keep going. See, clearly those two have no interest in what I'm saying. And that is exactly what is infectious about recreational biology. That when you are thinking about something and a question that gets stuck in your head, you must find an answer. So keep going. That is not the answer. Uh, OK, let me just jump to a safari that I want to take you today. I am going to be your host. Uh, we are probably going to run out of time. I will ask you which part of the kingdom of life you want me to go to. It's going to feel something like this. In this painting are all kinds of organisms that we actually work on. I want you to feel like this jungle safari. There's a little boat. Here is a starfish larva. Here is placozoans. You can see Lacrimaria is like a Loch Ness monster. Uh, there is Pyrocystis, another deep sea organism that we work on. And I will ask you to tell me which part of the tree of life you would like to talk about. And we will go on this safari. Uh, of course, it's a safari, so bring your tools. The only tools that I want you to take with you is power to observe, pencil and paper, and ask questions. And here is, I labeled, among, this is a very simplified view of tree of life, but last night I was thinking about it. These are sets of different organisms across the tree of life that we directly work on for the last 10 years. And there are certain puzzles that we have solved. We are here as humans. Uh, I could talk about humans and the tracheal systems in our lungs. But you know, I'm going to avoid humans because I really want to take you very far. So we have a few options. Uh, we could go to the deep sea. Uh, we could go to organisms uh, that were uh, some of the very first animals possibly that existed on the planet. Uh, they also happen to be marine. Uh, we could dive in and go around parasites uh, in the jungles of Madagascar uh, or some other place in the tree of life. Uh, where would people like to go? You can just, yes. Deep sea. Uh, anybody else? You only get one vote. OK, since there was only one person that spoke up, let's go to deep sea. Yes. Uh, everything on the table is an option. We can go anywhere in this tree of life. Uh, let's start with deep sea, because I think it will give you a flavor of the types of questions, and then we'll try navigating around. You know, I mean, this talk can take five, 10 hours. So we will just do little previews. But uh, and I will be doing this and moving around slides for some time. So as some of you know, I just returned from an ocean expedition. Uh, and one of the things that we care about is the sets of scientific tools have to leave labs and go out. So this is what life at sea looks like. This is how you have to do science. It's sometimes very cold. We have an expedition in the Arctic in uh, 20 days' time. Much of the stories I'll tell you is from this boat. This is Kilo Moana. This is uh, in, uh, around the waters of Hawaii. This is the Kuliak. And this is in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, but to just give you a real flavor of what we will see and think about is when I go diving and sometimes night diving, this is what the scene looks like. So what you are watching, first of all, is native density and biodiversity of life in the sea. So every drop of water is just filled with critters and creatures that look almost alien to us in terms of how they work, how they perform. 
And it's a very difficult question to even think about ecology of these types of ecosystems. Not only that, this ecosystem is actually stratified along the depth. Every single parameter, like the tropical rainforest to the Sahara Desert, it takes a long walk for you to walk directly from the tropical rainforest to a Sahara Desert. In the ocean, you can just dive deep. After the first 150 meters, it starts to get dark. After around 500 meters, it's pitch dark. There is absolutely no light, so if you're a photosynthetic organism, you better want to go up. The temperature starts to change along this axis, the salinity, the nutrients, anything you name it is changing along these axes. And what is remarkable are these organisms on their daily life are taking a journey from deep waters to the top waters and back and forth again. So you can think about the physiology challenge of how remarkably adaptive these organisms have to be if they are going to the rainforest and going to the desert and coming back in the morning every single day. So think about the types of physiology. And of course, when you start realizing this, you see that that physiology is actually uh, quite remarkable. Why should you care? And I know this is a recreational biology talk, and I told you I'm going to only tell you things uh, for no good reason. But there is one very deep reason that I'm quite concerned about. And that's why we started working uh, on problems in the ocean which is associated with this video that you're seeing. This is satellite data. First of all, if some of you have not realized, uh, the planet Earth is not really Earth. We should call it water. Most of the surface is covered with water. That's 70%. And what you're seeing is a glimpse of life in the ocean. You see how dynamic it is that forests appear and disappear completely within days sometimes. When we take a boat out there, we're trying to catch this feature not knowing that by the time we actually get there, it would disappear. It's a very dynamic system. And much of what's happening in the ocean is what is leading to carbon capture. So eventually, we emit CO2 in the atmosphere. That CO2 is used by these microorganisms. When they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean. And that gives rise to 50% of every CO2 molecule that humanity is releasing is currently being captured by the ocean. And the reason we all have to worry, and yesterday we had some conversations, is when you read the IPCC report, which is predicting and telling all the sets of predictions, which they've been incredibly right about, there is very little biology in it. So we don't know the tipping point of the system. We actually don't understand when this phenomenal system that's been working to save humanity will stop working. We don't know its bounds and its limits. And if it stops working, the PPM, uh, the parts per million of CO2 in our atmosphere will go from 400 to 600 parts per million instantaneously. So it's quite a dangerous game that we are trying to play. And the first question is, how do you really try to understand this question? Uh, first of all, a quick view of what it looks like to work at sea. Uh, this is the Drake's Passage. Uh, we just went to Antarctica uh, in this vessel. While this boat is crossing the Drake's Passage, that's the instrument that you will see a lot of data from. I'm not going to talk too much about how we build instruments, but we need to make instruments. We take microscopes at sea, but the boat is rocking back and forth. So I have to build an instrument to cancel that rocking. And you can see this rock. Uh, but you can actually do biology at sea. Yes. That's chlorophyll. Okay. Yes, and chlorophyll is a good representation of life, but it is only the skin color. What we don't understand is satellites can only see the few first few centimeters of the ocean. They can't see deeply. So when it doesn't exist, it doesn't mean it's not there. It's just gone deeper. And we have no way to do planetary scale mapping of biomass in the ocean. So you know, it is kind of fun to be able to think about these types of questions. Um, but the challenge is, and we kind of face this challenge while studying a parasite, is if I want to watch a single cell that's only 100 micron that will be traveling to the depth of the ocean, say, a kilometer, I will have to build a microscope that is a kilometer tall. Does that make sense? And we started building these microscopes when we were studying a parasite called schistosomiasis that infects people. That's in Lake Victoria. It's all across Africa. It causes bilharzia. And that parasite makes a journey of 50 meters up and down. 
So we said we will make a microscope that's 50 meters tall. If I wanted to bring this 50 meter microscope, we wouldn't have a place in Ashoka to put it other than outside. Uh, this is a picture from Madagascar. We actually did build that microscope in tubes. But while packing for Madagascar, we had an idea, which is I realized, why are we taking these long tubes? And what if you could connect the ends of these tubes to make a ring? And that led to what we now call an infinite field of view microscope, which is a new idea where I could watch an organism travel the z-axis over infinity. This is just as a reference, you know, say a 100 meter tall tower. And we ended up calling this technique scale-free tracking microscopy. But this is what we ended up doing. You take a wheel, and if you put an organism in a wheel, if the organism moves, you rotate the wheel exactly the same amount as which that organism moved. And so the, in the frame of reference of the lab, that cell has not gone anywhere. But in its own frame of reference, it's actually climbing. So this is not a cartoon. This is what that instrument looks like. It's a little more complicated than some of the other instruments that I brought with me. You can see there is a big glass wheel. We lock the organism at two locations. 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock are two points in which you can levitate this cell now. It can be a single cell that's either sinking or rising, and you rotate the wheel just the right amount to be able to lock it. So let's just see what are the views. So first of all, uh, this is at sea, where we are on Kilomoana. And I'll talk about this cell in a second. It's a very puzzling cell. It's a cell that is like a donut. You can see the instrument out there on a boat. And then one of the unfortunate things that happened right at this moment is we got hit by a storm. So the challenge is when you're working out in the field, you don't control nature. And right there, five hours after this, the conditions were so difficult that the captain called off the entire expedition. And we had to turn around. And it, we waited three years to get back to that spot to finally find that cell again. We searched for this cell for three years continuously and we couldn't find it. And you know, this is what it feels like to work on a boat. Uh, there is a lab just like any lab, but then there is a deck and it open seas. And this is what the sea looked like a couple hours later when we were returning. So you know, it does get tough out there. But on the other hand, we were the first people to observe this cell. And we were the first people to see this life form in its natural environmental conditions. So I'm hoping that some of you after this are not scared of going to sea, but are actually inspired and excited to spend some time on boats. OK, so let's just look at some animals. We're going to start with metazoans, which are animals. But we will be in the part of the tree of life that are called echinoderms. Uh, this is a baby larva of a starfish. How many of you have actually seen a starfish? How many of you have held it in your hand? Still a few hands are up. That's fantastic. It's a remarkable creature. It looks nothing like us. It has these five arms. But its babies look very different. It goes the same thing that metamorphosis happens. And the baby looks like this. And I'm going to play this video. Now, the animal is actually climbing for hundreds of meters. But to you, it will appear as if it's just floating in space. It has tiny, tiny little cilia, which are little whiskers that it's using to swim. It's spinning in place. But in fact, what's happening is that the microscope is tracking it as it travels meters. So now we have a tool that we can catch an organism in the ocean, bring into this virtual reality environment, and ask what it's trying to actually do. So let's just look at all kinds of animals. And the first thing you notice is you always should study behavior. Because we don't know what is its thinking. So we turn off all the lights. The only thing we can't do is we can't turn off gravity. And you notice that the animal is just climbing, climbing, climbing. But every 100 seconds or so, it actually stops. It reverses its cilia. We believe it's sensing for food. And then, boom, it's going to do that again. You see it changes its morphology. It rotates around, but it knows where the gravity vector is. And it will align to gravity again, and then turn back, and just keep doing this process over and over again. And from this data, we actually learn, after collecting this type of a data for roughly around 300 or so species, we learn that almost everything in the ocean somehow detects gravity. 
but we don't know how. We have no idea of a mechanism that's associated, for example, for that little organism to detect gravity. Uh, so let's go to reveal a little bit of what else is going on. Now you're looking at the same animal, but I have tethered it and I have lit up the flow field around it. So what I've done is I've sprinkled little beads and you start seeing this incredibly magical flow field. Uh, I don't know what this reminds you of. It reminds me of magnetic fields, but these are hydrodynamic fields that it's generating to trap organisms and feed. We yet don't understand how is the geometry and morphology. For example, these larval forms have all kinds of geometries. One of my favorite is the crown uh, of a queen larva. This larva is shaped like this because it has little whiskers and cilia along the way. They generate currents that lead the organism to swim. So it's not like how a fish would swim. We don't have any principles as yet to even understand how these forms are actually moving around in their environment, catching food. And it is only possible that when we start looking at biodiversity, that we could understand basic principles about what might be happening. And these very same principles of how cilia control flows are happening at this very moment in your brain. Our body is completely covered with this exact same organelle that is conserved through the tree of life. And they are causing these types of complex flow patterns. But unfortunately, it's very difficult to see that directly in human brain, while you can really observe and watch functions of many of these organisms very directly if you're interested in trying to understand ciliary function. Uh, it turns out we can also take this organism and light up its brain. But it has a very simple brain. It's a brain that's made out of a ring. It's called the ring nerve net. And we can label different types of neurons that are associated that are now talking as a function of development stages. So for the first time, you can watch. It's almost like an airplane being built while it's flying. We can watch how it's thinking and how it's thinking changes as a larva goes from a you know, one day, two days, all the way to almost a month when it's navigating the ocean and trying to go wherever it actually wants to go. So let's look at a coral larva for a second. Uh, now we are jumping from echinoderms to cnidarians. You might think that coral, uh, how many of you have seen coral before? Uh, you know, they don't move, right? But again, their larvae actually are incredible swimmers. And what you're watching, again, that same principle, an idea of aligning with gravity. This is a coral larva trying to find its way in the open ocean. And you can see it's swimming around. It's going to navigate. And eventually, it will decide to settle. And it's carrying enough food. It's not feeding in this time. It's carrying enough food to be out there in the ocean for hundreds of days by itself. And one of the big things of why we're trying to understand this is the fact that these sets of organisms are dying rapidly. So we have no way of recovering and restoring them unless we understand what their larvae are trying to do, which are these coral restoration projects. Uh, I'm going to switch and say one more thing about my favorite organism in this context, uh, which are these really bizarre looking cells that so far we had thought don't have the capacity to move. And the video that you're about to watch, we have absolutely no idea what's going on. It is my favorite microscopy video I have ever collected. And it is, uh, you know, it's almost as if it's magic. We're going to talk about a diatom. Uh, many of you have heard that word diatom before, right? Diatoms we have known so far have no capacity to move. They can't swim. They don't have flagella. But you're about to watch uh, that it actually turns out that they can swim. And I'm going to play this video in a second, but I want you to understand what you're just watching. What if I drop this object that's in my hand? You know, it's a dead object, and I dropped it from here. I'm not going to do that because it will break. But if I had dropped it, it will fall, right? But imagine that while it was dropping in 100 millisecond, it could freeze itself in air. And then suddenly, within a few minutes or so, starts dropping again. 
And that's what you're about to watch for a single cell that's heavier than seawater, that has no capacity to swim, or nothing like a flagella or a swimming arms. And we'll play this. You can see the cell is falling, and boom, 100 millisecond, it's changed its density by 10% to be completely suspended in water. We have absolutely no idea what kind of biological processes can change density at such a vast scale. Because for you to change your density, you need to do something. You need to take something in, and then it has a mind of its own. And uh, at some point of time, uh, I know when this happens, it will decide to go again. Why, why would a cell do that? And by just studying these sets of things, we discover and learn principles that these sets of organisms that we have labeled as non-motile actually move, and we don't know how they do. And if you have any idea, at some point of time, at the end of the talk, you should shout out, how would you actually do something like that if you were that cell? OK, so we were in the ocean. I can keep talking about the ocean, but I want to take you to tell you about, uh, maybe, maybe I'll tell you about one more cell. Now, this is a cell that we found uh, uh, out at sea. Uh, and this is a very deep diving cell. And this is a cell that causes bioluminescence. It's called pyrocystis. It's in the category of organisms that are called dinoflagellates. Uh, it emits light. But it has something that no other cell that I know in terms of geometry and topology, which is it is shaped like a donut. So think about it as you know when we draw cells, you draw some kind of a sphere. But when you look at the cell, so first of all, we caught it at sea. And it was doing two things. It was sinking sometimes. It was rising sometimes. But yet again, it has nothing to swim. And we decided to take a look at it using a kind of a microscope that's called light sheet microscopy, which is you can actually observe the real geometry of that cell. And you're going to watch something pretty bizarre that unlike a cell that you've been told is like a round ball, this is a cell that is made out of tiny little threads that are connected together. So for the mathematicians in the room, this is the first example of an N genus torus. A torus is essentially, so a, a donut is a one genus torus. It has one hole, right? Does everybody understand that? You take a ball and you make a hole in it. That will become a donut. What if you make two holes in it that we will call a two genus torus? This is an N genus torus because it's a cell that has hundreds of these holes. And it uses these holes to do something quite bizarre, which is it likes to inflate. So I'm going to let this play out. What the cell is doing is it sinks to the bottom of the ocean, decides, oh, no, no, I don't want to be there, and suddenly inflates like a giant balloon and then uses that ballooning, it takes water in and rises back up again. And then that same process repeats over and over again. This is one example of volume change of a single cell that is the largest recorded volume change that you can imagine. But we would have never discovered this unless we were actually out there. Uh, let's talk about predators for a second, because uh, I mentioned this cell that pretends to be a cheetah. Uh, and I think I want to also bring this back to fold scoping. Uh, there was a point of time uh, on one day, just like yesterday, when I was with my lab, poking around and catching cells in a pond. And I stumbled upon a really funny cell. And I'm going to show you and tell you why that cell is funny. Uh, so let's just take a look at it for a second. Uh, we will watch, yeah, maybe let's watch this video first. So tell me what you see. Uh, this is a cell. And did you notice what it just did? Let me play that one more time. So it struck. And this is the cell. It somehow has a neck. And it likes to strike and catch other cells right there. And then it engulfs and changes its geometry. This is not an animal. It is one single cell that has the capacity to morph and search around itself and find food like as if it has an arm. 
But again, let me repeat, this is a single cell. So the idea of saying arm, head, neck doesn't make any sense. And then it morphs itself to be able to ingest that. And it does that over and over again. So now you can see they're all hunters. They're sitting there tossing out like a fish line, catching food here, catching food there. And the question, you know, this is an observation, but the question that becomes clear is, are they thinking? So can single cells actually think? Do they have a mind of their own? Why did it go this way and not that way? This is very complex behavior, but what would, is there a brain inside the single cell? Uh, one funny thing is that they don't eat each other. So yes. They don't, I, uh, and we know that there are certain receptors that are at play that they somehow can detect a sense of self, so they're not cannibalistic, at least in the conditions we have seen. And you'll watch this again, it's going around, it has lots of food around it. And this is real time, by the way, this is not sped up. The cell is doing this on its own, and then again, going back to what type of questions would you ask? You would ask, how is this thing thinking? But also, how can a tiny little cell generate these very, very long arms? Because it would require you to make the material for that arm, and somehow it has no problem in just, I mean, everybody has seen Incredibles. You know the superpower in Incredible that was in the mom, that it could stretch infinitely? Somehow it looks like it has that power. And a 50 micron cell, has the capacity to stretch 500 microns. Where would all that material come from? Like, I want to stretch my arm, it doesn't go beyond that. Uh, and it actually turns out the answer is in origami. Yes? That's correct. So it doesn't form an arm at the other location. So let me just show you what the geometry of this cell looks like, because I promised you that these are geometrical puzzles. So we took a label which is called a microtubule label, you should think about it that all cells have little architect and rods inside them. Like a building, if you strip away these walls, will still have rods. And it has this really strange architecture. It's a woven basket. And somehow it has this capacity that it can flip and fold this basket in and at any given point stretch it to make it like this. But this transition happens in one second. And we started thinking about it. It looked like some kind of a telescopic arm that can go back and forth. And we asked ourselves, could this be origami? Everybody knows what origami is, right? Uh, art of paper folding. And this inspired us to actually invent a completely new kind of origami that's never been discovered before. And it's the first time that a cellular structure actually is using origami. We know plants use origami when they fold their leaves. We know in space we use origami to make these massive structures, but it's cellular origami and we mapped its membranes. And I think one of the things that I'll show you is I'll just show you this with an example of a type of an origami. What it's doing is it's folding its pleat structures in a helical architecture. So it's a tube that has all of these wrapped around. And to understand, the blue is the part where it's unfolded. White is the part where it's folded. And you can see I'm stretching it. For example, this object and this object is same, except now I have stretched it. And it's storing and tucking that membrane inside. And you can actually watch these folds. So this is a process called Transmission electron microscopy, a very powerful microscope, and you can see these origami folds inside this cell. And again, going back to this notion, what this has led us to actually realize a new type of an origami and mathematics for this to be able to generate telescopic-like structures in single cells. Um, I am probably running out of time, so maybe I'm going to tell you about only one more part of the Tree of Life safari. We can talk about uh, animals that don't have a brain at all uh, and are still animals and how do they think, which I've been calling this idea of mechanical intelligence. Could you make intelligent computers out of springs and nuts and bolts? Or 
uh, we could talk about uh, uh, many other things, including a cell that can talk to its neighbors uh, by sending pressure waves. Uh, between the two, which part? Oh, actually, also, we could talk about um, a puzzle in uh, spiral organisms itself. So an animal that makes spirals, uh, an animal that talks uh, using uh, pressure, uh, but a single cell, or an animal that has no brain and uses mechanics to actually think. No brain, okay, yes. Uh, we call this the zero brain limit of life. Uh, and actually, it makes us think quite a lot about where does a brain even come from to begin with. So first of all, uh, when you go back and look in the tree of life, you actually realize this is the Cambrian explosion, this massive number of animals, but all the fossils we have all of those fossil systems actually had already developed a brain. But a neuron, everybody knows what a neuron is, should have occurred from somewhere. Where did it come from? Because you have single cells where we don't even have an idea of a neuron or a brain because, of course, it requires communication. And suddenly we have all these animals that came 600 million years ago that have complex brains. And to answer that question, we had to ask ourselves this very simple idea. Does there exist an animal alive on the planet today? And this is an animal, so I'm not talking about a single cell. The definition of an animal is already that it has millions and millions of cells, like we have trillions of cells. And we looked at the tree of life, and we actually, at the base of the tree of life, we found two animals that do not have neurons but they have very complex behavior. So does anybody know of a name, other than reading it here, of an animal? I know one you already know, uh, which is sponges. So many of you know what sponges are. They live in the ocean. They're called periphera. They do not have neurons. They never develop neurons. And then the other one that we actually work on are called placozoa, and it's a very strange animal. It's the strangest animal I have ever met, and I'm going to tell you why. But before, I need to introduce the animal to you. First of all, this is what an animal looks like in the lab. Uh, you're watching it. And what strikes it as a really puzzling thing is it's the only animal I know that has no fixed shape. So you know the movie Flubber? Has anybody seen the movie Flubber? Or you know, think of it as a blob that can just shape shift right in front of you. So you're watching it just move around. And it, can, it has no head, it has no tail, but it can just change and morph from one shape to the other in real time. And it's also flat. So unlike most animals that are more complicated, it's like a flat beach ball. So this is, if I cut the animal, you see it's flat. And of course, one of the questions to think about is, and I'm just going to play this video for you to see, Tell me one thing that you see. So they're all clonal animals. They're crawling around in the dish. You can find one animal that's that big, while another animal that that's tiny, and they are clones of each other. So somehow, when we as humans grow, we try to be of fixed size. And of course, there are some people that are short, some people are tall, but there is still a limit to it. Here is an animal that has no limit to its size. It can keep growing to sometimes the almost centimeter scale. And the question is, so if you watch it, can you see a funny, puzzling behavior? Is it doing something that surprises you? We're trying to go from observation to question. Anybody? If you watch it over and over again, just watch one. Yes. They are merging. They are coming close to each other, but they don't merge. I mean, that would be funny if I walk to you and we just merge. Uh, they don't do that. Uh, yes. So they can detect each other. That's what it means. Yes. They are moving in all kinds of unique ways. And I would say they have different shapes. Yes. Exactly. They pause. So notice, you have to watch one, 
and it's going around its way, and then suddenly it freezes, like Pink Panther. And it goes around another place, and then suddenly it freezes. So suddenly we have gone from an observation to a question. And this is what I want you to do. When you observe things, and it actually turns out that was the hint that we needed, that some complex processes are happening here. Uh, and how do we get to it? You know, in terms of what you have to sometimes do is to really watch an animal. So we built another instrument to now watch this cell. This is the first time we can watch every living cell in an animal completely. This is called in toto imaging. So if we have trillions of cells, imagine building a microscope that I could enter that could watch every single cell. I know that's not possible today by technology, but by choosing an animal where we could do that, we actually discovered these remarkable activities in these cells while the animal is freely crawling around. And you can see what every cell is doing, and you can see it's firing these uh, contractile waves. And if I zoom in, you can see individual cells but you can also see every single cell in an animal. And that allows us to be able to make the discovery of where the brain is. And since I'm out of time, I'm going to tell you about this big idea we've been thinking about. We call it a mechanical brain, that it is actually possible for organisms to purely use mechanical principles to think and learn. So, what I've labeled now is inside the organism, I have labeled a type of a cilia, and you are seeing these patterns emerge. And when you see this, what does this remind you? There is something you might have seen macroscopically that this looks like. How many of you have seen bird flocks? Right? You know, when birds move together, but these are not birds, these are single cells. And I'm just going to show you, this is what these little single cilia look like. And let's just go to see where the flock is. So this is every single cilia in this animal. And you can see that they were rotating. And then suddenly they decided to go. And now this is a bird flock. And seemingly on surface, and you could ask, where is the brain of this mega animal? It's not in one animal. It is associated in how these things are talking to each other and looking at each other. So the same principles that apply here can actually be applied at cellular scale. And let's just watch this flock one more time. So now I've slowed it down. You can watch these are the individual cells. And they are walking with these sticks. So every time you see that stick, they are using it to walk on a surface. But somehow, they can talk to each other and make a decision collectively to go somewhere. And when they don't, the right half of the animal walks in one direction, the left half walks in the other direction, and they split right in the middle, and that is how they divide. So when they can't make up their mind, they're actually fracturing themselves into tiny little pieces to be, and these are principles that don't exist. When we study animals, you don't think about this. That, wait a second, there can literally be half the animal has made up a decision to walk away from itself. So it's a little bit like what you said, but not fusion, but fracture. And the animal is still perfectly fine. And of course, we do a lot of mathematics to be able to build computer models of these types of systems to then really understand its brain in a computer and ask a question of how does the capacity to compute in this brain change as a function of the size of the brain. We don't understand this question so far. And again, this is at a limit where you can ask these questions for systems that don't even have a neuron. And then maybe this is the last video I want to show you. So instead of now showing you all of those little uh, legs, I'm just showing you where the center of that vortex is. Vortex is this idea that all of these legs are rotating around a center. And it's as if you are watching this animal think. And if that center is somewhere in the middle of the animal, that bright spot, it's going to just keep turning. And the moment that kicks out, you notice that it ran away. right? So it went from searching from food here to suddenly going away. But now we can see mechanically what was it about its activity that led to that transition, but without having any neurons or nervous system. And borrowing from this idea, 
we were finally able to actually build a very strange material. So one of the questions when you think about biology is biology is also inspiration. And we asked a question that if this living organism can do this, can I actually make a brain or a brain-like object? And many, how many of you have heard about AI and machine learning and neural networks? So there is a very deep principle between neurons and machine learning. Because the unit of operation in machine learning is what is called a perceptron, which is equivalent to a neuron. And what we asked is, can we make a machine learning architecture that has no computer, no electronics, but is only made of springs and nuts and bolts? And what you're watching is the first sets of units. And I'm just going to play this video for a second. What this non-living material has the capacity to do is, for the first time, actually learn. So if I was to make, for example, a wheel out of this particular unit, we call this a very strange kind of a spring, an adaptive directional spring. And as we connect it, it can learn, for example, what are the bumps on the road, and it can reconfigure itself so you don't feel the bumps. And then some new bumps on the road come along, and it can again learn and change itself. And one of the key things about this is this idea that we are taking a mathematical principle that existed in neuroscience, but implementing it in a mechanical system. So this is the actual unit. And I'll tell you where the memory of this is. First of all, it doesn't need any power. It uses power from the outside. And I'll just play this. And you notice when I shake this here, this is a motor, something behind starts to rotate. And so that rotation is its memory. It's trying to remember what types of inputs that it saw. And when it's connected to other inputs, this is the input and this is the output. But this output is dependent on what it remembered from the past. And so when you now, just like neural network, I start connecting it, you can start making all kinds of learning materials that have no electronics and are only made out of mechanical parts. And again, going back to that idea of a mechanical brain, uh, it is probably possible uh, that lots of things like these uh, might have existed. So I'm going to close at this point. I just want to mention, you know, there's lots of fun people that I get a chance to work with. Uh, what we talked a little bit about is this idea of animals that don't have a brain but can still think. Cells that actually use principles of origami to stretch and in strange kinds of ways to catch prey. Life in the deep ocean and how cells can actually move without having any perceptive way or capacity to actually move. And then also, uh, how fun it is, is to just take a journey and walk into the tree of life and stumble upon problems, you know, not the problems that were given to you. So at any moment of time, any of you, I'm going to just end with this picture again where we started. Any of you could take a stroll or a walk into this garden, what we call the tree of life. You could even throw a dart for that matter. I, I, some of you like playing dart. Make this board and throw a dart and see where you land and ask, how will I find this animal? So if we were to throw a dart and I just found glass sponges, then your job is, how do I think about that glass sponge? What does that actually mean? And when you start understanding the fact that they're using all, because life has a common origin, we know that there are common principles to all parts of life. But if you don't familiarize yourself with this garden, it's very easy to get lost. So as a scientist, your job is to really explore, go in the bounds of places where people haven't gone before. Because most likely, you will find your own origami cells and your own brainless animals. But it's very important that you take that journey yourself. There is lots of tools other people can provide, but nobody can tell you where to go in this garden of life. Uh, so I'm going to close there. We have time for questions. Uh, I always uh, go a little bit longer, so apologies for that. Uh, and I'm happy to just turn this into a Q&A. Oh, let's also just check what's going on with our little animals that we had put there. Uh, 
Okay, yes, question. I don't really have a question. I was just saying, could you share that PPT with us? Yeah, this will be online. I think this is being recorded. I'm happy to share that. Yes. Oh. Thank you, Manu, for yes. Talk. Two things. First, is the answer for the donut question 10? Um, keep thinking, keep thinking. At 3.30, I'll give the answer. Yes. Okay. And the second? Say that again. Eight. 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 And the, and the, keep thinking. No, no, no. Don't shout the answers like that. And the second uh, question We is, will talk about it for a second. Yes. The second question is... Looks like nobody was interested in the talk and you were all just calculating. It was just a joke. Uh, yes. What's the actual so, question? So, uh, the second question is related to the talk, like the, yeah. the concept of mind and the brain. So do you yes. think that because life originated from a single point, as it, as it diverged, uh -huh. in being the tree of life, the mechanical brain that you are proposing, along yes. with the biological brain that we are, most of us are interested in, plus a chemical brain. I would say brain. they're all, they're both mechanical. Maybe what you're interested is an in electrical brain. And I'm saying there is an, another analogous brain that is a mechanical brain, and also there is a chemical brain. But unfortunately, all three brains have combined together in our head because evolutionarily all of these things have existed. So going back to another part of tree of life, we have the capacity to tease them apart. Okay, anyway, that was not the, that was the clarification. What's your question? My question was like, do you believe that there could be a parallel evolution leading to these three different kinds or concepts of brain? But since you have already answered that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. These... This is all parallel evolution. Animals do what they need to do to solve the problems that they're in. It's not necessary that you need to develop the same kind of, so electrical activity is fast, but mechanical activity is actually very close to electrical activity. If we all hold hands at this point, and I'm not gonna have you do it, but if you all were to hold hands, and then I was gonna just shake somebody, and that shake was to be just transmitted along, I would have transmitted information, and that's sufficient possibly for me to be able to talk and send messages to other parts. And that's what's happening in animals all the time. And it's not as if we don't have a mechanical brain. That is your perception system. Many aspects of how forces get processed and perceived. So studying basal animals and animals that are very far from us allows us to think about many processes that are happening in your own body that you might not even realize. Like, for example, many of you might not have realized that the blood in your veins that's running right now has the exact same salt concentrations, uh, sodium, potassium, many things as the ocean. So it's fair for me to say that you have ocean running through your veins. And why should that be? Because we all came from the ocean. So our physiology is actually, although far diverged now and we don't have the capacity to live in the ocean, there are certain remnants of that that have always been preserved. Questions? So can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so like I had three questions actually. Yes. What would you define thinking as? Like what thinking, when you say that this animal is thinking? Thinking, yes. Can you uh, define it? Yeah, I think we sometimes get stuck in the linguistics of many of these words sometimes. You know, there is thinking, there is learning, there is cognition. Of course, I didn't use the big word consciousness. And often enough, what I'm thinking about, now I am thinking, is, you know, just the process of computation, what you would call, that is going on, that's taking inputs, changing the internal sets of states, and then using those internal states to change your environment, and you repeat that process. That's a baseline state. And then on top of that, if your states themselves can take inputs for long periods of time, you can build the context of learning. And it's important for us to start from the very bottom to be able to state how do we classify. But it is also important not to anthropomorphize. The way that we think, it might be that the octopus has completely different principles of how its brain works. And so, you know, I think one of the challenges that what we do in this work is we mathematically show what these sets of input-output functions are and mathematically what does the learning rate look like. And that's, you know, so that's a much more formal language that you can use for these systems. 
And another question is that like, like a lot of these things are moving, right? Yes. That would need energy. So yes. Like, do they, do, do like animals at this level still depend on glucose or like some sort of carb? carb yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody has to eat. So going back to you had noticed that they pause. You know what that pause was? It's time for lunch. So they, they don't have a stomach. They don't have a mouth. They are like a flying carpet and they go around and they will just cover up something that's growing on the surface. And that pause was release of enzymes to digest the food outside their body and absorb it. Because it's the only animal that doesn't have a gut. It doesn't take food in. It digests the food outside by a flying carpet. So of course, all of these animals, including that other cell that likes to eat other cells, it is, that is their source of energy. And as long as you're not photosynthetic, you do need to actually eat. But the way they eat is very bizarre. Okay. And uh, when, the, when you show that thing, that origami part was stretching and yes. folding, what, what exactly is that, that is stretching and folding? So it's the membrane. So it turns out all our cells are made out of soap bubbles, kind of. But a soap bubble can't stretch infinitely. So what the cell decided to do is make a lot of, you can't make this soap, it's called lipids, so quickly. So what it does is it makes a lot of soap and folds it very nicely. And to organize that fold, it also makes these wires that are inside in a helical pattern. And so that origami is essentially how these wires and these membranes are folding and unfolding just like a sheet of paper. But what's really fun about this is we had not appreciated that a single cell that is so small can very precisely fold, unfold, fold, unfold, fold, unfold millions of time in its life. I mean, you know, many of you saw the James Webb telescope that was sent out. People were really worried that we had folded it here, we sent it to space, and we wanted to unfold it only one time. And everybody was so panicked that one fold that's wrong and the whole operation would fail. Here is a cell that folds, unfolds its membranes millions of times with not even a single error. I mean, I've been watching this animal for 10 years. I have not found any time when this membrane doesn't fold back. And again, some of you caught some beetles yesterday. Some of you removed the elytra and you found the wing inside. Beetles do the same. They fold and unfold their wings thousands of times in their life without any error. And that's what's surprising, is the fact that a cell can actually do that. Like has, the has the animal been, been named? That's now? correct. It's called Lacrimaria oler. Uh, and of course, there are many other species that we have discovered. Uh, but, uh, you know, the animal was described in 1800s. And what's problematic in biodiversity is people just put a name to it. And that's the end of the story. But these animals are trying to tell us stories that we might not even appreciate until you look at with eye of a curiosity. So I don't want you to just discover that 99.99% of life. I want you to understand all of life. And there's a big difference. That's how you go from observation that, oh, I saw this. Then you go to another place, I saw this. That's not sufficient. You have to ask questions and you have to understand them and then you have to really use all of your facilities of physics, biology, chemistry, mathematics to be able to understand these principles. Any other questions? Yes. Good afternoon, sir. This is Panya Chaudhary from Mumbai. Sir, my question is, how do microorganisms communicate with each other? Excellent question. Uh, they do them in many different ways. And maybe to answer your question, I'm just going to show you a movie of one of a new kind of communication that we discovered. And then I'll tell you how microorganisms normally communicate. Uh, so normally, uh, this is called quorum sensing. Uh, microorganisms send chemicals. And that chemical can be a pheromone or some kind of a small molecule that then the other organism can sense. But the problem with that is uh, what is called diffusion. So when I mix my sugar, it takes time. That's why you have to stir it. Because they cannot communicate far. 
And that was the problem we were thinking about until we discovered this organism called spirostoma. And it has the capacity to talk to other microorganisms. It's still a single cell, but using something very strange, a pressure wave. So I'm just going to first show you the cell. What this cell is doing from time to time, it just contracts. But notice the time scale here. This was five milliseconds. So a second has a thousand millisecond, five millisecond. And the velocity at which I've slowed this down for you to see, otherwise you won't see it, is if I read it here, it's 0.3 meters per second. So this cell that just contracted actually sensed around 20 G forces. So when a human senses around 10 G forces, we actually get knocked out. And this cell is generating 20 G forces to contract. And I, we found this both lacrimaria and spirostomum using a fold scope literally just like what we did yesterday. And that puzzled me. I thought, why should a cell do this? Until we came to the lab and we saw this movie. Now, this is a high-speed movie. Watch the cell, uh, the time over there. A cell somewhere here will contract, and somehow that information will propagate in this network. And we named this idea hydrodynamic communication, is to communicate cells communicating by pressure waves. And if you were to argue that pressure waves are sound, then these cells are literally talking. So I'll play that one more time. So watch there. Nothing is happening. Everybody's happy. This cell contracted. All of these cells sense that contraction because it sent a pressure pulse in the liquid. And all of this is happening in 40 milliseconds. This communication is literally faster than electrical communication in your brain, but it's happening in cells that are not connected to each other. I've just connected this graph to show you how information propagated. And then again, this is a discovery that we actually made just looking at cells under a fold scope. So I would argue that we don't know how microorganisms talk to each other, because you know, just looking at it, we discovered one way, and you guys might find totally another way of actually communicating. Yes, and then yes. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, pressure waves, right? Yes. So are they sort of sending out different kinds of pressure waves to communicate different things, or is it all just one kind of a pressure wave? Yeah. it's. Uh, as far as we know, it's just one signal. But there might be different ways of contracting. And why I forgot to mention, why did they do this? It turns out this is a very large cell, so it's very delicious. So predators like to eat it, but then they contract to generate a toxin. But one cell cannot generate enough toxin to deter a predator. So this is equivalent of howler monkeys. Or you know when dogs bark? When one dog senses danger, another one, and then everybody starts barking. So by talking very quickly in 100 milliseconds, hundreds of cells have generated a toxin. And that's how. So that's the one talk that we know. But there might be many more. And I think this is just dependent on if they were to contract in different sets of ways, uh, they might generate signals that are slightly different. But so far, as far as we know, we have only just seen this one type of contraction. Wouldn't it be fun if it like Morse code, it contracted a little bit, stopped for a few seconds and contracted, and that information would propagate differently, and you could mechanically detect something like that. And maybe that's a signal to do something else. So it could be like a language made of pressure waves. That's correct. But as far as we know, they only have one they have only one piece of information that they communicate so far. Yes. And then there is a question there. Yeah. It seems to have a directionality. Sometimes the closest Absolutely. cell is not picking the signal, but it's so, going all the way up and then coming yeah, down. Now you really opened up a can of worms, and that's a whole another talk. Maybe I'll just tell it, draw it here. Uh, we wrote a theory for this, and it turned out it's very close to antenna theory. So every cell is an antenna, and because it's elongated like a cigar, when it contracts like that, it generates a dipolar signal in the pressure wave. So the liquid generates these vortices, and then these vortices shoot out. 
So you can see a cell that's well aligned to it might see this pressure wave differently than a cell that's aligned like that. And so I can now do this mathematical calculation and show for every angle what is the sensitivity of this sensing because this cell has to mechanically feel this pressure wave. So just like when I talk, there is directionality. When they talk, there is directionality. I don't think they are trying to be directional. In fact, just their geometry makes it directional because it would be ideal if they could talk isometrically because their neighbors are around them in three dimensions. But there is a lot of geometry. And actually, the way we solved it, we borrowed these ideas from antenna theory. Because remember, when the TV, I don't know how many of you remember. How many of you remember that TVs have antennas? See, only the, the younger ones, you still remember that TVs have antenna? And remember when you go up and the cricket match is not coming and you go and you twist? How many of you have done that? OK, that's the only the older. What? I'm still surprised that you guys are still doing that. But that's what you're doing. You are twisting this to match the antenna in which direction that signal is coming from. And we actually use the same theory to understand this cell. There was a question there. Yes. This is like a posed photo. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, you can just say. I I think I would say quorum sensing is the one that people have been thinking about as a universal language for microbes, because it's not universal that everybody can sense it, but a, a specific clade of species can see. So many bacteria can talk to each other, even in groups, for example, when they form biofilms or other things. But as far as I can tell, there are no universal languages. But think about it this way, in our gut, there are all these happy microorganisms that live. We eat food. They talk to each other. When a pathogen comes, they talk to each other. So often enough, all the microorganisms are not found together. So there's no evolutionary reason to talk to everybody. And sometimes animals want to, or microorganisms want to talk to each other with their own species because they're trying to gain advantage against another species. So it's actually very good to have a stealth language that not everybody can understand. But there are some molecules that are much more universal. And the second one, uh, pre-sample pressure wave, how do we able to replicate that? Because it works from predicted response. Yeah, yeah, we can stimulate this pressure wave and they will respond. We can also electrically excite them. So we can put a little uh, electrode and we turn on. So we can now program this behavior very specifically. So I don't know if we are talking to them or not. But I mean, in some sense, we are talking to them. Yes, there's a question at the back. Uh, yeah, so I have two questions. Since there's such a like, vast variety of microorganisms to study, and you know, even through the full scope, you may be seeing thousands every few seconds, how do you decide which ones to study and which ones are relevant for uh, scientific progress? Um, let me turn this around and ask you a question. How do you decide when you go on a holiday? So to me, this is a holiday. And you know, I am seeking adventure. And you just go to places you have never been before. You push yourself. So you know, I had been thinking about the deep sea since I was a child. And then we figured out our way to get there. And we realized that we can actually answer many of these questions. So sometimes, although we use rationality in science. You should also use your intuition. To go where others have not gone before it sounds like a good place, because you might find things that others have not discovered yet. And trusting your intuition is actually an important aspect of science, too. And there's no, you don't, in this world, you can simultaneously go to many places. In the tree of life, although I am in the ocean, the entire tree of life is represented in the ocean. Literally, I mean, when we were out there, I was casting my net to catch small things, and a fin whale jumped out. And I was like, no, I don't want mammals. Uh, and it was just right there. So we were out there yesterday, and the entire tree of life was represented in that tiny plot of land. Uh, 
And then you said something about what is important or useful to science. You will never know that until you find out. I know many of you know the CRISPR story, but I'll repeat that one more time. Somebody studying yogurts found these tiny little patterns and sequences, and it was just a mathematical puzzle, kind of like a palindrome. And eventually, that became one of the most important and powerful tool in genetics right now, which is CRISPR-Cas system. They didn't know that it's going to be useful. All they wanted to know is why is there a palindromic pattern to it. So often enough, as a, as a curious person, you should just go to new places, document what you do. But what is not so easy, I think you guys have all seen the easy part in the next two days. I want to transition to the hard part is how do you go from observations to questions? And those questions don't have to be relevant to someone else. They have to be relevant to you. Because like poets and artists, we are all trying to answer our own curiosity. You know, I don't really care if anybody in the world cares about what we do. As long as I have the luxury to explore, just like a painter or an artist, you paint for yourself, you write for yourself. So, there is a sense of person that you have to inject in your own science. Thank you. Uh, my other question was that the widely accepted theory I read about was that plants use uh, statolites to, uh, for their geotrophism. So is there some similar phenomenon you've observed with the bacteria that stop and uh, detect gravity? Yeah, I think we have found five completely new mechanisms so far by studying 300 species for detecting gravity. And I bet there are going to be you know, hundreds of different mechanisms. Because literally, the entire tree of life, with millions of species at sea, trying to solve the same problem, uh, there are probably many, many mechanisms that are out there. And you know, the statolites and these little rocks that sometimes organisms can make are not just found in plants. They're actually found in many of the larvae. And ironically, I know of one cell, a microbe, that also has a rock inside it that it uses to detect gravity. It's called the Mueller's organ. Uh, and it is a tiny little, it makes a little hole in itself, it grows a rock, and when the rock tumbles, it figures out where is gravity. But this is independent coevolution. These were not borrowed from plants, they actually discovered this idea independently. And gravity is very important. You know, gravity has existed on this planet from the very beginning. So organisms have had, uh, and there is lots of advantages of detecting gravity, uh, even on terrestrial context too. Uh, 